So um, Melissa will be sending this to you online. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show this. Uh, the first page on this handout deals with a couple of the, tr the different timelines for when the Exodus happened. Anytime you deal with this book, you have to deal with two realities, the timetable and location. Um, and to be very clear, we cannot definitively pin down either. Yet. I think archaeology is getting closer and closer to this time period. We're seeing more and more further back. But by the same token, we also need to understand something. If the story we have in the book of Exodus is true, why would the Egyptians want to have any account of it? Because it makes them look really bad. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say that up front as part of the reality of what we're dealing with. That as the story goes, he who wins the war gets to write the history. And, and so over time, Egypt in particular has seen pharaohs go back and wipe out sections of their history and rewrite them. There is a whole period of time where uh, what is called the Upper Nile, or currently Ethiopia area, the Nubians had conquered the Lower Nile. And, and they so they had African pharaohs for a while. And when they were finally driven out, they went back through and cleaned out all of the black pharaohs from all of the hieroglyphs. You could see them scratching off things. But we've never had that kind of thing happen before, have we? You know, where one party wins and they come in and they clean house of everybody from the opposite party. <laughs> all the time. So, <clears throat> that in mind, I want to acknowledge two things. One, there are three dates that are given for the Exodus. If you start doing some studies, you'll hear of what is called the traditional date, the early date, and the late date. The traditional date that is given is usually put around... Uh, 1313. This is a scholarly date. This is when they say that there's the most archaeological evidence that lines up with it. And this is not on either of the timelines that I show here. The, the late date for the Exodus is around 1270 BC. The, the problem with this date is if that is true, then that means that the timetable for how long they were in the land before King Saul reigned, how long actually was the period of Joshua and Judges, is severely shrank. So you have an, a, an issue there. And again, I told you guys, my reaction, the way I'm going to approach Scripture is I'm always going to approach it from the standpoint, it's telling me the truth, and I have to figure it out. So the early date, which many people ascribe to of 1270, for me just doesn't really fit. Uh, the timetable just isn't enough because then you end up with only 180 years of from the for Joshua and Judges and then the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before you get to King Saul. Now, we have found proof there have they have found archaeological proof that David was a king in Israel. So despite the fact that a lot of people want to say most of the Old Testament is just not true, it's fictional made up stuff, we have found record of proof that goes back to at least David. And David was king from about 1010 BC until 970 BC, those 40 years. It says that Saul was king for 40 years before David. So if you put that in, then that brings it to 1050 BC. So then you have approximately, it says, 400 years from the time they left Egypt until King Saul. So if you put 40 years for the Exodus, and then a pro right here we have 356 years in what's called the early date. I want to put the show you guys again. Um, this actually puts the Exodus at 1446 BC. 
Um, let me see if I can. I guess I could share a screen. That's a smart idea, dear. That's why I keep her around. That's why she gets paid the big bucks. <laughs> Let's come over here. I hadn't thought about that. We'll download this. You could probably print that out. I could. Did she just sent to you. Yeah, I emailed everybody. Go to it. Did she email you? Do you want me to go print? Just do it on your phone. <laughs> Let's see. I don't have my phone. Okay. Oh, I can get it. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. Just down. Trying to get this quickly. Sorry, guys. Yeah, but this is a Mac. I'm just. She hasn't seen it yet. Okay. Now I got to get. This to where I can get to the Zoom. And now I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to share this. There you go. Mm -hmm. So there you can see this timetable. Um, now, for a lot of people, this puts it back far far further back into the past than what a lot of people are comfortable with, but it fits the biblical timeline better. Uh, let's see. I want to go to the next page and I need to rotate this around again. And we'll see if we can scroll up here to the date. So one of the things that we know from history, and this is a proven reality almost all Egyptologists agree on, is there was a period that began at 1657 BC that was known as the Hyksos period. The Hyksos period was a period when Egypt was ruled by Semitic pharaohs, non-Egyptian pharaohs, they were pharaohs who came from a group of people from the area of around Canaan. They were either Canaanites, Hittites, or maybe, just maybe, you know, you might have someone like Joseph. Just saying. Um, but that period was from about 657 until uh, the end of it was 542. And remember, at the beginning of Exodus, it tells us, and then a Pharaoh came in who didn't know Joseph, and they began to oppress the Israelites. At this 1542 period, uh, Egyptian, native-born Egyptians began ruling again. And so wouldn't that kind of line up with this notion of somebody who would subjugate outsiders? And so with that... <laughs> Uh, that in mind, then that allows for uh, Pharaoh Tutmos III to actually be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, now, one of the things that, that people will point to, and the reason that they uh, archaeologists will go with the late date, the 1270 date, is because the Bible mentions two cities in particular, right? Calls them Pithom and Ramses, right? Well, the thing of it is, is we got to remember there's a difference between what was the name of the cities that they were building and what were they called when this story was written down. Prime example of this. Remember the, the Western story I talked about where Abraham chased the kings to go get Lot back? And it says they went all the way to Dan. The city of Dan didn't exist until the Israelites were in the land. And the, the tribe of Dan was actually supposed to conquer along the shoreline, and they couldn't do it. So they went into the hill country up north, and they took over another city, and they renamed it Dan. 
But for the people who were hearing the story, they didn't give them the original name. They gave them the name of Dan because that's what people would have known the city as. Do you get what I'm saying? So I don't think there's nearly as big of a problem with it being called Pitham and Ramses because they could have built them as something else. And then later when, when Pharaoh Ramses was born, he renamed the city after himself. No one's ever done that before either, right? So I, I just want to acknowledge some of the things before we get into this book. So the, the third page kind of gets into the details of when Moses was probably reigning. And now I want to, I'm going to go to this one, the next two pages, which are the map. Um, when, when it talks about, and I grabbed the wrong one, but that one still works. So we'll go to the last page. Most of your Bibles, if they have a map in the back, are going to put Mount Sinai down at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. That's the reason it's called the Sinai Peninsula. But the problem comes in, if that's where Mount Sinai is, then more often than not, they want to say that they didn't cross the Red Sea, they crossed the, crossed the Sea of Reeds, which they would say is um, in the, where currently the this uh, Suez Canal is. This area is a swampy area. Now, two things. One, that could be the case. Um, and I would say what's amazing to me is the Sea of Reeds, most of that area is only about a foot deep water, which makes it easy to cross, right? But it's far more miraculous that the entire army of Egypt was swallowed up and drowned in a foot of water. So they might solve one problem when they say it's that, but they create a far different problem. I tend to, again, want to take scripture at its word. I believe that they absolutely crossed the Red Sea. So in order for them to cross the Red Sea, it requires some different pieces. And so this map that you have here, I believe that they crossed at the bottom of the Sinai, what we now call the Sinai Peninsula. One of the biggest reasons for this is, do you remember where Moses' wife came from? Midian. Midian. Midian is in current day Saudi Arabia. Not on the Sinai Peninsula in Saudi Arabia. Remember where, uh, what Moses was doing when he saw the burning bush. He was tending his father-in-law's flocks in the hill country of Midian. Mm -hmm. So I think this map makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, there actually is uh, this mountain, uh, Mount Al-Luz, which laws, I don't know how to pronounce it because I'm not from the Middle East, but if you look at pictures of this mountain, the top of the mountain is black. Now, Think about that for a second and remember what it said. For 40 days and nights, Moses was up on the mountain and God came down in fire and lightning and storms, right? So it might make sense that the mountain would be black. By the same token, there is a nice giant rock that is split in half and out of the base of it, it looks like it's had water erosion coming through the middle of it, but not on the outside of it. Just nice little convenient pieces. So I tend to go with the earliest date, 1446. I tend to think that the timelines of how long it took them to get places are true. And therefore, when it talks about where it took place, um, and we could go into detail on that, and but I don't want to take up too much of the time because I told you I'd also give you other pieces. 
I tend to think that this is the far more accurate location for where it would have taken place. Any fast questions about that before we actually dig into the text? I would say speak now or forever hold your peace, but you can come ask me questions later too, and that's fine. I, I do have a question. Sure. Um, I've read where the um, called the Gulf of Suez. Yes. Um, I've seen where there was a, a ridge that went across at a particular uh, spot is kind of the midpoint in the length of it. And um, the two sides came pretty close together. So I'm guessing on this map, they would be just about where the um, wording ends there on the map sheet where the narrower part there is. Yeah. And um, this ridge uh, was not as deep as the rest of the Red Sea. Um, it was something like uh, 10 to 15 feet deep as opposed to being as much as 270 feet deep um, in the rest of it. And that uh, um, occasionally, you know, you get these strong winds coming in and it would pile up the water in the north end and uh, actually expose that ridge. And it fits conveniently with some other archeology span uh, that was found. Um, but not a whole lot was was made of the discovery, even though the, the discovery is back in the late 1980s, I think. So a couple of things. I've got a map up here. That's actually, this is a topic, topographical map from right now. It's actually Google Maps. Most people who want to say, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right, right here is Mount is St. Catherine's, which is the monastery where they the traditional site for the Exodus is. Most who affirm this as Mount Sinai would say, like what you're saying, there's a, there's a, a ridge that's right across here. Um, and they would point to that. Part of the problem comes in that in order for that ridge to be the location, what it says is that the Israelites were pinned in from both sides on a plane where they couldn't get out. Well, this area right here, while it is hilly, moderately mountainous, it's there's no way to be pincered in from two sides there. By the same token, over here, right here, across this spot right here, there's another ridge. On either side of this ridge, they've actually found two pillars one is worn and you can't read it. The other, though, speaks of King Solomon dedicating this as the site of the Exodus. Um, now, whether or not that's actually the site of the Exodus, I don't know. But what, what is true is right here, it's kind of hard to see. I'll see if I can getting used to this. There is this little plane right here. Um. There, you can see right here, this is a wadi. What a wadi is, is it's a dried up river that's only a river during wet times. But this plane right here could fit the description because there's a road that goes along this river and then there's a road along the Red Sea. And so it could have been that the children of Israel came up, came around from the bottom to this plane. And then it says that Pharaoh divided his army and they sent part from the top and part from the from the bottom. And so they could have been trapped on this plane. Most of the more modern stories 
kind of take this picture into account when they describe the land of where they're at. And this is fairly close, again, to where those pillars are. Where I propose it is, is down here, because if you look at this map, you can literally see that a ridge. This ridge is very clearly visible. It's about 150 feet below the surface, which is still very miraculous that God could move the water to where they could walk across. It talks about uh, a citadel, a, a defensive place. And right here, they found the uh, ruins of a former outpost that would have been used to watch for ships coming up from the Red Sea. And it talks about the island, um, I forget the exact wording of it. Uh, let's just turn there. Let's just have the discussion. Why are we talking in possibilities when we can just talk about realities? Um, we are dealing with Exodus chapter 14. Well, without, we'll just read a big chunk of it. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pyrotha between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Zephon. Okay, so we got three different places, right, that are listed. Pyharoth, which I don't know about that. Migdal means tower. Guard tower, watch tower. Um, and that's where they've, like I said, right here, they found the, the remnants of an archaeological site that was a watchtower for the Red Sea. This, the other, Pi Hiroth, actually means, um, or not the, sorry, Baal Zephon. This means the, this is a place that's called the Isle of the Wind Gods. This island right here has been given similar names throughout most of human history, and it's an isle that is absolutely known to be covered with birds and have lots of wind through this area. And so I think that these three pieces, while we don't know where exactly Pi-Haroth is, the other two make it, it make sense that you have a big plain here where again, the Israelites could have come from around here and camped over here, and the Egyptians could have come from the north and again, pinched them in. They were back against the sea. You have this Migdal, which is the, the, the ruins of the, the watchtower, and you have the Isle of the Birds, as it's often called. And so God blew... And it's uh, the other piece to this is we got to remember. It says that they crossed the Red Sea in how long? One night, about eight hours to go down, cross over, and come back up. Now God could have went to one of the deepest parts of the Red Sea, and they probably could have traversed down and come back up. It would have been very precarious to do that with all their carts and animals and children, and everything else in the deepest part. So for me, I tend to lean that the, the Straits of Tehran is where it was at. And then if I come over here, uh, you get a nice little plain that could be the wilderness of sin. You have over here the, the mountainous range. And then right here is... Jebel Alaz, which is, that's not a very good picture. I'll show you some a better picture. <laughs> Got to get used to. There's a picture of that rock that's split in half. You can see the line right down the middle of it. And they said it looks like Water erosion on the inside, but not on the outside. It's, it's, very, it's nearby to the Alas. 
mountain. And somewhere there's a very good picture of the mountain. There you go. Normally, for mountains, the top part is lighter in color and the bottom part is darker in color. And yet you can see very clearly that the top part of this is darker and the bottom part is lighter. Almost like it was burned or something. I don't know. Maybe. That's my case. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again, I'm sure, but... Could be a strata of uh, basalt. Very well, could be. I mean, there's lots of reasons where why it might be darker up there, and, but I'm just saying the pieces seem to fit together to where that makes more sense. This is in what used to be Midian. Um, there's the correct amount of places along the way that fit the story, uh, and it takes about as long as what they're saying to walk the distances, and so I. My my gut tells me that that is the place and time of the crossing for the Exodus. There's lots of smarter people than I who've made cases for other timelines and different places. So, any questions on that? Any thoughts? I jumped ahead of myself, I know, but. Because I told you guys I was going to talk to you about the 12 plagues, or the 10 plagues and the gods that they... They crossed the Red Sea before they went to Mount Sinai. So either they had to cross on the Gulf of Suez, on, you know, if you're looking at the Y that is the top of the Red Sea, they had to cross up there or up in the sea, like in the marshland that they called the Sea of Reeds which again, they each of the, them have their own uniqueness to the story. Um, but, you know, they were kind of a little bit of a nomadic people, so I'm not for sure they were really concerned with drawing good maps about where they were leaving. They were more concerned about where they were going. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay. I'm going to try to keep this short because this gets very technical and for people who aren't as interested in this, I don't want to bore you with it. But when you look at the 10 plagues, uh, a handful of things, and first we probably ought to talk about the two, um, what were the two miracles that God told Moses to do to convince the leaders of Israel and Pharaoh? Do you remember? Throw it on the staff to, and to turn his hand leprous. Yeah. Well, if you notice, most if you've seen anything, more often than not, Egyptian pharaohs are have the headdress, right? And they have a, a serpent or a cobra on their forehead, correct? The serpent, the snake, was a symbol of victory for them. So when Moses turns his staff into a snake, it is a symbol of God's victory. Um, notice also, while the Pharaoh's uh, magicians can do the same, God's snake strikes first and God's snake eats theirs. Mm -hmm. Symbol of God's victory of what's going to come. Um, by the same token... Uh, in the same way that if you notice one of the, the two most prevalent healings in the Gospels are people being having demons cast out and lepers being cleansed, right? Because in their world, people did not recover from leprosy. So when Moses puts his hand in his, in his robe and it comes out leprous, he would immediately have been kicked out. But for him to put it back in and then come out clean, that's a sign of power. Because no other God did those kind of things. Does that make sense? So when he tries those first, they don't really work on Pharaoh, do they? 
So the first plague was what? You might remember? Turn the water into blood. This was a direct attack on Osiris and Hopi. Happy? Hopi? I don't know. H A P I. These were the two gods of the Nile River. And it was essentially, while these gods were, were meant to be over the production, life, uh, fertility, love. And, and so you have this notion, because again, they see the Nile as their lifeblood, right? It's what allows them to have fertile ground. They, they learn to control the flooding of the Nile so that they could have the irrigation that they needed. And so in a very real sense, turning water and specifically the Nile into blood was a symbol that these gods of life, these gods of agriculture were bleeding. God was attacking them. Now, of course, Pharaoh's music musicians, magicians, <laughs> make the same thing happen right what about the second plague anybody remember frogs so heck hect h-e-k-t was the goddess of fertility and she was a frog-headed goddess i'm just i mean well have you ever noticed how many eggs frogs lay i mean they're we talk about rabbits being the, but frogs are, are, so anyway, her job also though was to keep balance to where not too many people were born, but not too few people were born, not so that there wasn't too much death or too much life. It was meant to be balance and fertility within the world. So when all of these frogs come, everything is out of balance, right? And so God has now attacked three of their gods. What's the third plague? Gnats. Uh, the god Jeb was the god of dust and earth. Uh, there's also an unnamed gnat god. They haven't figured out what this one is, but uh, this notion of dust and dirt were supposed to help the earth. And instead, the gnats devour and so there's an attack here on this reality that the earth, which was supposed to give them life, is thrown into the air. And therefore, is it usable for plants anymore, for growing things? No. And it turns into gnats, which start just pestering life. And so that's four or five gods, depending on whether or not you count this unnamed gnat god in that. The fourth plague was what? Flies. Flies. Or swarmy insects. Um, Pepri was their god of creation and insects. He was important for pollinating. You know, we recently in, in America, we've talked a lot more about pollinators and, and how much they're needed to keep, uh, you know, flowering plants and fruit plants going. But uh, Kepri was supposed to eat the insects so that there weren't too many of them. His job was to keep the insects in balance. His, he would create them so that they would deal with the, the things that they were supposed to, but he was also supposed to keep them in balance. And so when you have swarms upon swarms of these insects, he's no longer in charge, is he? Are you starting to see a theme here? God is showing through Moses and Aaron that he is more powerful than their gods. Um, fifth one, the livestock. Hathor was the goddess of love, fertility, and Apis was the goddess god of strength and vitality. Both of them were cattle-headed deities. They were a pair. And, and so this notion of of vitality and, and love and strength, and for both of them to die would be a serious omen, would it not? And so you have here, now we're up to, uh, we're in the fifth plague and seven or eight gods have already been attacked. The sixth plague was what? 
Oils. Oils. Isis was the goddess of health, and Thoth was the god of medicine. And I'm certain that they were, were trying to make appeal to them. And it, of course, does it get them anywhere? No. I need to silence that. So now we're up to 10 different gods and six plagues that God has directly assaulted them. And the seventh plague was what? Not just any hail. It was hail that was burning from the inside out. That's kind of odd, isn't it? That's a very unique kind of hail. You have smoldering uh, coals that are encapsulated in ice. And so if you don't die from the ice striking you, then it breaks open and it lights things on fire. Good time was had by all, right? Uh, Nut was the goddess of the sky, and Horus was the god of the sky, and they were supposed to bring good things from the sky, not destructions. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is at this point in time in Exodus chapter 9, verse 20, did you take note of that? It says, some Egyptians believed and followed. They finally are like, okay, our gods are nothing. We want to follow your God. So now we're up to 12 gods that, that have been assaulted by these plagues. The eighth plague was what? Locusts. Locusts. Nepri was the god of grain. Ermutet was the goddess of the crops. And they are both depicted as locust eaters i mean in most of the the uh the hieroglyphs of them they are eating locusts as they're holding grain see the symbolism there no coincidence in that is there um and so they're they're not doing their job they are not keeping the locusts at bay and the plants are being destroyed so now we're up to 14 gods. Ninth plague? Darkness. Darkness. Anybody know what their high god was in Egyptian pantheon? The god was called Ra. And his depiction was the sun. And so in the ninth plague, Amun-Ra, or Ra, the god of sun and light, and they would need light to replant, but it's pointless because without light, it's impossible. And so the ninth plague, God attacks their high god and says, I am in control of light and darkness, not you. Now this goes a step further because Pharaoh was said to be the son of Ra. The high, their high God. And so here God has taken on 15 gods in nine plagues. Um, the, the final plague was the death of the firstborn. Now this, there's a level at which this actually does attack three different gods. But the, the key point in this one is that what was it that Pharaoh said to do with the Egyptians? Throw their firstborn in the Nile. And so what Pharaoh required be done to the Israelites is now being turned around upon him. Pharaoh was the God of men. Ma'at was their God of truth, justice, and harmony. And by now, I'm certain that they questioned all truth and wondered if there was any harmony. They definitely would question justice. Uh, Nephethus was the goddess of death, who was supposed to control when people died and who pe which people died. And of course, Anubis was the embalming god, the, the stager of death. 
and all three of them are put on trial with this one. Now, that was what the Pharaoh originally did. Yes, all the male babies. It, it wasn't just firstborn, no. But can you see how these are not just haphazard? Yes. Now, the irony on this is if I was making up plagues, I could probably make this happen, but I would have done it in a different order. Right, because I mean, if you if you have a bunch of gnats, then the frogs would come after the gnats, not before. You know, locusts would the boils would probably come after the locusts and after the swarming because we've known that bugs can carry diseases, and you could make it happen, but the order just doesn't fit unless you see this as a systematic affront to the gods of Egypt. One of the things we're going to see over and over again is God at war with humanity. Are we the enemy? No. Humanity was made in the image of God. Therefore, God is always about redeeming humanity. Even when humanity is used for evil purposes, humanity is not the enemy. Okay? This is something you're going to need to remember when we get into the books of Joshua and Judges. Because it pays a, plays a pivotal role in understanding what's actually going on. Okay? So... Notice, like I said, in, in chapter 9, verse 20, many of the Egyptians finally consent, and they become part of the, the people of Israel. Now, the interesting thing about this is, do we ever hear about an Egyptian tribe? No. But why would we? Because they become part of Israel. Oh, but wait. Weren't there two sons of Joseph born of an Egyptian woman in Egypt? Yes. So couldn't Egyptians probably flow right into these half Egyptian tribes? Just just saying. Maybe. Just maybe. Any other thoughts on these this first? Because I two sons wouldn't have had as much time to populate their tribes. And yet if you if you looked at the maps, you'll see that Manasseh, one of those two sons, has two halves of his tribe, and each half of his tribe has a section that's larger than most of the other tribes. Maybe. I think this is a picture that of what God is saying from the beginning. Remember his call to Abraham was that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Even Mitzrayim, the house of Ham, the ones who have stood against them. Make sense? Mm -hmm. God punishes sin. And remember, Jesus says, it, the one who causes my little ones to sin, it'd be better that they have a millstone tied around their neck. Remember that kind of harsh uh, yeah. phraseology? God attacks the spiritual entities that are causing the people to sin. Remember that discussion back in Job? If we were going paragraph by paragraph, I'd handle this a lot slower and we'd unpack it a lot more, but we've got a lot of ground to cover. Any, anything else you want to talk about in the Exodus part? Sure. One thing that's confusing to me is that it sounded like, 
plague of life or lime, livestock were destroyed. And then it mentions livestock being affected by the boils and livestock being affected by the hail as well. Um, and so that was just kind of confusing to me. If it kills livestock, how, how would there be other livestock to be affected so by the lamp? Within the Egyptian and Middle Eastern culture, there are actually three main kinds of livestock. Cattle, sheep, goats. And so three times you have the livestock attacked mm -hmm. for their three main forms of meat and such. Also, you'll notice the plants, the, the uh, vegetation gets tacked multiple times. Um, part of that is there's the early harvest, which is the barley harvest, and there's the later harvest, which is the wheat harvest. And then you have the final harvest, which is the fruit trees harvested. And so there's this reality that God is systematically attacking each area of what they depend on. So we can't say... Well, we killed the cows, but at least we have the goats. That's right. And we can't say, well, we don't have any grain, but at least we have apples. That's right. I mean, he's literally, as everything was taken away from the Israelites, so God is stripping everything away from Pharaoh. Remember that. He's not stripping it away from the people. Who owns the land? Pharaoh does. Who owns all of the grain? Pharaoh does. Who owns all the animals? Pharaoh does. When did that happen? With Joseph. Remember that? So this is not an attack on the people. Hear that very clearly. It's not an attack on the people. It's an attack on Pharaoh and his gods, of whom he is the man god. I would assume no. Yeah, yeah. Claiming to be a, a god, claiming to be a deity probably doesn't get you in w good with God. And that's probably not the wisest thing in the world to do. I have a question. Sure. Uh, what's the significance of, or I think more than once, where God hardened Pharaoh's heart? I was hoping somebody would bring that up. So this is an odd phraseology, okay? Uh, one of the things you have to know about the Hebrew language is essentially there are only 900 root words. Um, each word can be used in multiple different ways. I'll use an example. The three letters of the, of the Hebrew alphabet, which we would say M-L-K, or Malik, mean king. Amalek, remember hearing that, actually means little king or prince or the king apparent. That same word, if it's not used to describe a person, it becomes kingdom. Those same three letters, if you add the, the declension to, to make it so, if it's a verb, it means to reign or to rule. And if you were to make it feminine, it means queen or princess. So that one word can mean multiple different things. Now, also, though, when you're talking about an action, so this says to harden Pharaoh's heart, right? A, an appropriate translation of this verb phraseology is that God allowed Pharaoh's heart to harden. How often throughout the Old Testament do you hear them pray, soften my heart, O God? So what this is, this is more often than not, I think that the, the translation, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, is failing to take in that fact. It, a more appropriate translation is God allowed Pharaoh to harden his heart. It's literally the thing, uh, one of the most 
horrible uh, phrases to hear in especially all of scripture, but particularly the Old Testament, when it says, and God gave them the desires of their heart. Because when that happens, it it really never goes well. And so my interpretation of this, uh, Mike, is that what it's saying is God has been stopping Pharaoh from going as far as he wants to go. God is keeping Pharaoh's heart from hardening. And there comes a point when God's like, okay, if that's really what you want to do, go for it. And so God allows Pharaoh to harden his heart. And as Wesley and Arminians who believe in free will and that we have the choice, I think that that's a, a more accurate picture of what's going on. Pharaoh's Pharaoh himself, and we see this today in politics, don't we? Where a leader gets caught in something and instead of just confessing and trying to make it right, what do they do? They, they double down and they just dig their hole deeper, right? Pharaoh cannot... And even when he does admit that he's wrong, he immediately turns around and goes against it, doesn't he? And so I think that this phraseology of what is saying, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart, is really should be read, and God allowed Pharaoh to harden his heart. God let him make the decision that he's wanted to make. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it, it, it was confusing. And, and some of this is, again, that Hebrew phraseology and the way that they talk. I mean, I don't know if you've done, if any of you have done uh, language studies, but um, Madison has took four years of Spanish in high school. And the way that they order their sentences makes no sense if you were to directly translate it into English. It just doesn't. And so what happens here is when they translate from one language to another, Usually you have to reorder the words for it to make sense in English. Does that make, you get what I'm saying? Syntax, exactly. And so part of the problem here is what, what, what prepositions are actually being used in this instance. And so I, my notion is this syntax uh, is more along the lines of, and God allowed Pharaoh to do what he he let him do the desires of his heart, which was to exert himself as ruler and to say that he is better and bigger and stronger than God, which we all know is arrogant and it didn't pan out very well for him. Yes. In the NIV Bible, the commentary says that this is 18 times his heart was hardened, nine times he described to God, and nine times he described to Pharaoh. Hmm. So some of it, uh, that they at least are acknowledging that that phraseology could be read either way, right? So if you didn't hear him in the NIV study Bible, it says that the 18 times that phrase is used and nine of those times it's attributed to God doing the hardening and nine of the times it's attributed to Pharaoh doing the hardening. Oh. So even in that, they're, they're acknowledging that that can be read two different ways. Anything else on the Exodus side? So one of the neat things I noticed this time, actually, I'm not for sure I'd say that it's neat. Um, did you notice in, what was it, chapter 16, after they crossed the Red Sea, right? Um, well, no, it's at the end of chapter 15. They decide to move on and they find bitter water, right? Mm -hmm. And then God makes the water sweet. And this time they ask for God to lead them. And they immediately find these 12 pools with 70 palm trees, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I had never taken note of, who led them to the bitter water? Maybe. They did. Maybe. What has been leading them all the way up until they crossed the Red Sea? 
the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. They didn't ask God to show them the way once they got through the Red Sea. And they didn't wait for God to lead the way. And because they're not waiting for God to lead the way, and because they didn't ask for it, I'm sure you ladies can think of something about men not asking for directions. I'm sure that that's probably in there. But the reality is once they find this bitter water, and who do they complain against? Moses. Mm -hmm. well, with no water to drink. And he takes the bitter water and he throws what into it? A stick. Mm -hmm. But it's specifically, it's an acacia stick. Mm -hmm. now, now, for this area, acacia wood is everywhere. It's one of the only woods that's around. But it's interesting that the same wood that God uses to make bitter water sweet or drinkable is the same wood that he would have them use to build the tabernacle out of. So the tabernacle is a place where you can go for your bitterness to be made sweet. Hmm. Hmm. And they don't see the pillar of cloud and fire again until they get to Mount Sinai and then they build the tabernacle and God descends and fills the tabernacle. So God led them to the sea. They crossed through the sea. Then they didn't ask God to lead them the rest of the way. And so they got to meander around and they complain and grumble and they finally make it to Mount Sinai. Um, did you notice in chapter 20 what's going on there? Specifically, verse nine, or chapter 19 into chapter 20. We all know what chapter 20 is, right? That's the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Who is God talking to when he gives the Ten Commandments? The people. The people. He's actually talking to everyone. All of them hear the Ten Commandments. And once they've heard the Ten Commandments, what do they say? Yeah. They're like, we don't want God to talk to us. Moses, you go talk to God and talk to us on behalf of God. God wanted to communicate with everyone. And they were so afraid of him, they refused to listen. Did you catch that? But that's never happened since then, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, a little tongue-in-cheek there, too. God wanted, not only did God want to live among the people, it was his goal to have an individual relationship where they everyone talked to him, but they rejected that, and so therefore... God gave them the priesthood to be mediators between the people and God. They asked for something to mediate between them because they didn't want to talk to God directly, and so he gave it to them. Now, are any of you guys also doing the New Testament in a year reading? You are? Anybody else? We had an interesting conversation a couple of days ago about the fig tree. Remember that? When Jesus curses the fig tree, it feels out of place. Except that the fig tree was the symbol for the priesthood of Jerusalem. The priests were required to give assistance to anyone who was working for God, like a traveling preacher. They were required to give food to them. When Jesus goes to the temple, do they have anything for Jesus? No, they kick him out. So they're, the priests are supposed to bring people to God, and they kick Jesus out. They're supposed to help those who are working for God, and they give Jesus nothing. 
And then on top of it, the fig tree was meant to be a tree that, well, because the fruit really doesn't drop off a fig tree. You actually have to go pick it. it. And the fruit will stay on most of the year. Well, it only tends to ripen once a year. You can eat it even when it's pre-ripened. And it was meant to be a tree of hospitality that the traveler and the sojourner could go and harvest from the fig trees when nothing else was available. And the fig trees around the temple are bare, which means they have been picked clean, which would be against hospitality. And so Jesus curses the fig tree as a curse on the priesthood because it has failed to do what its task was. God initiates the priesthood because we don't want to talk to God directly. And by the time that God comes to live amongst us in the flesh, the priesthood isn't even doing its job. But again, some of that you wouldn't catch on. You wouldn't pick up on it unless you understood the priesthood and what and how it developed and what its task was. After they receive the Ten Commandments and then they say, no, you go talk to God on our behalf, that's when Moses goes up on the mountain, right? I'm trying to remember how far we read today. I don't want to get too far ahead. Well, I mean, I guess we can... Reminder, next week is Ash Wednesday, so we'll be having service out at Hillsdale, and you're all invited, but we won't have uh, Bible Hub next Wednesday night. You're welcome to, if you've got questions that we, we didn't uh, cover, you're welcome to call, email, text, um, stop by. I'll try and make time for you if you've got questions. Mm -hmm. Write them down, yeah. Hand them in. I'll try to handle them. But for today's reading, we went through 27. Um, any questions you want, or anything you want to talk about in what we've read so far? Okay. Through chapter 27 is what today's readings were. It's a big part of it, yes. Because even within Christianity, there began to be this push that there are the holy ones and those of us who are not as holy. And so within Catholicism, they started calling their leaders priests because we're, we believe in the, we're the priesthood of all believers, right? That's what it says. And so priests' job were to lead people in worship. And so therefore, the person who led in worship could be a priest. Over time, it began to just be synonymous with only those who led in worship. Ooh. And so within Catholicism, they have delineated their leaders as priests. And in the Catholic Church, most of them don't go directly to God. Yes, they go through the priest. Which is, again, kind of the system that was set up within the Old Testament. It's a Christian version of it, but it's still much similar to the Old Testament system. Yes? Exactly. Excuse me, but some reason, when I went through reading this time. I, didn't, I don't remember reading about the golden calf. <laughs> Has it hasn't happened yet. It Technically, it doesn't happen until, uh, is it 32? So, part of what happened, so to tell the story, to get it in context, Chapters 21 through 31 are all happening while Moses is up on Mount Sinai. 
So originally God was going to tell all of his plan to all of the people, but they didn't want to hear it. So then we get Moses going up on the mountain to receive God's plan. And so we're hearing this 40 days of what's going on. Then at, at chapter 32, we go backwards in time and we get the perspective of the Israelite people. Where is this Moses at? He's gone up there. Maybe God's killed him. And so then they go with the golden calf. Now, for the record, it probably wasn't a calf. It was more than likely a bull because a bull was a symbol of strength. And, and in fact, in Solomon's temple, the sea, the, the basin that they washed in, was put on the back of 12 bulls. So it was not uncommon, even within Judaism, to use bulls within their religious worship. Again, they weren't to worship the bull, but it was a symbol of strength. It was a sing symbol of how God had given us the ability to domesticate the animals and to subdue the earth and make something out of it. But they call it a calf more as a pejorative sense, <laughs> as, you know, it was probably an ox, yes. But that's what happens. So you have these chapters where God is telling Moses his plan. Then you come back, and in chapter 32, you get the golden calf. So it's happening at essentially the same time, but you're getting two different sides of the, the coin. Yes. And if they were using it to pull a wagon, you wouldn't have pulls. You'd have steers. Correct. But you want them to go where you steer them. <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? Well, that's why they call them spears. You can't spear a bull. Mm -hmm. Don't know what you walk into. Fair enough. <laughs> it's 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 no. I... Gold star for you today. <laughs> Don't be looking for them in puns very often, but I'll give you one today. Yes, sir. Pharaoh and the Egyptians could see how powerful God was. Yes. But if you think about it, the Israelites should have grown and seen how powerful God was and been in awe of God and went to the war to follow God. But yet, history shows us that. So we see these people who have experienced these 10 plagues. Mm -hmm. They go through the Red Sea and they watch God's miraculous power there. God gives them water from the rock. God makes food come from the ground. God sends them quail. Although my facetiousness wants to read the story of quail. Oh, you want meat? Fine, I'll give you so much wheat that you don't know what to do with it. And he just swallows them up with quail and it starts going bad because they can't eat it all. Sorry, that's just... Uh, it's a good thing that I was not the disciplinarian when the kids were young because it would not have gone over well. Um, but they time and time again, they see God moving. They see God's yeah. power and a and little bit of things go wrong, and they whine and complain. And where are you at, God? Right? Right. And we do the same thing today, don't we? How many times today? It's just what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, why did God let this happen? He wouldn't have done this to us. The person turns right around and goes off and eats and makes something worse. Yep. Yeah. Going back to the priestly order, um, 
And then fast forward in Revelation, you know, the church of Ephesus, and the, uh, he says that, that he describes it to the New Galatians, which Ephesus does too, with the rejection of the uh, priestly order. And is that kind of what I'm thinking? So the, Nic the Nicolaitans, there's debate as to what exactly they were at about, but many believe that it was a special priesthood that you had to get into, and they embraced much more of what the priests of the Greek gods did, which was increasing sexuality within the body. Free love. I'm just saying. But that's that's never come back either, has it? Yeah, something, Nancy? I think that's what today's reading said. Yes, I do. The last question. So this book, for if those of you who have the the daily study guide, yeah, uh, says says question four. Uh -huh. It says. So question four says throughout today's readings, which is Exodus twenty five through twenty seven. God orders the people to make things of one piece or a single whole. Why might this be important symbolically or practically? Uh, so chapters 25, 26, and 27 are dealing with the tabernacle. Um, part of the reality is um, I think that we're dealing specifically with clothing, articles of clothing, articles of clothing. You're dealing with the coverings of the tabernacle, so the tent itself, and you're dealing with the furnishings and the stands and, and poles for the walls. What do you know about what happens when you put two pieces together to make one thing? Mm -hmm. Not as strong. It's not as strong. It's a good place for it to break. It's a good place for it to tear. And so part of what God tells them is that if you follow my laws, your goods will not wear out. And so he tells them how to make this in such a way that it should last longer. Now, we know from the biblical story that the tabernacle exists for the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Well, 39 of them. Because the first year, they're basically sitting there at Mount Sinai building the thing. The 39 years in the desert. And then the 356 years, right? That they have the Joshua and Judges period. And the 40 years for King Saul... Because it isn't until, and plus the 40 years of King David, because it isn't until Solomon that the tabernacle is replaced by the temple. So this tent had to last about 480 years or so. That's pretty good craftsmanship, isn't it? For being made out of wood and cloth. <laughs> In case you couldn't hear online, he said the more holes that you have, it's it's more it's easy to or to damage it, but it's also going to create spaces where like the wind and sand could get in and, and on the Ark of the Covenant and the, the items in there. So the significance of this is God is saying, I I want this done out of one piece. We can make things out of multiple pieces a whole lot easier, right? But to do it from one piece adds strength to what is being made. I had down one that's without the mode of getting, so I was wrong with that. You were on the right track, yeah. 
No, absolutely. Any other thoughts or questions? Anybody ever heard somebody say, well, God really doesn't care about the details just so long as you end up at the right spot? You ever heard somebody say something like that? If you ever have, point them to the second half of Exodus. God goes into great detail about mm -hmm. the tabernacle, right? Yes. And then for good measure, instead of saying, and they did what God said, which would made the whole story a lot shorter, right? <laughs> they make it a point, as you're going to read in the next couple of days, of them doing exactly what God said, and they have to describe every single part. So you feel like you're reading the, well, you are reading the exact same thing again. But God doesn't care about the details. I couldn't get over the lampstand. You couldn't get over the lampstand. Okay, say a little bit. The leaves and branches shall be a one piece with the lampstand. With the lampstand, hammer out of pure gold, seven lamps and seven lampstands. I mean, it was just very intricate telling them how to do it. And I'm thinking, oh my Lord. If any seamstress is in here, um, how you do much embroidery? Have you done much? It's very tedious. It's very tedious. Have you noticed how tedious these garments would have been? Intricate embroidery. Um, I like to remind uh, the ladies that who do that. Um, being able to do that is apparently a gift of the Holy Spirit. On the guy's end, you have, I always wanted to, there's a part of me that always wanted to be a blacksmith. You know, there's just something about taking raw ore and hammering something out of it and making, regardless, you notice um, it's, well, actually, I guess we're not there yet. So I'll get, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but in chapter 31, looking ahead you have Aholabab and Beziel this is the first time that scripture speaks of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and it's for craftsmanship the ability to make the articles of the tabernacle the ability to sm uh, to smith the, the metalworking the ability to make the cloth and the ability to embroider the goods and to set gems and make perfume. These are craftsmanship skills. And the first time that it mentioned the Holy Spirit being needed to make something happen, it's craftsmanship. So don't let you ladies who are quilting and embroidering and sewing, don't let anybody tell you that that's not a God-given gift. I like to remind people, I'm a carpenter's son. I can't cut a straight line. There's a difference between knowing what to do and having the gift of craftsmanship to actually do it. So that's a little bit of getting ahead, but I like to point that out, especially since we won't be here next week. Any other thoughts or questions? We got about 10 minutes left. Because we'll, uh, in this next week's readings, we will finish Exodus and move into Leviticus. So now a good chunk of what we're going to read at the end of Exodus is just a repeating of the tabernacle as they do what God told them to do. There are days I feel sorry for, for Moses as a leader. Sometimes church people just can be annoying. No offense. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and you know, who can blame the guy? I mean, right? They're just constantly grumbling about him. And when he finally says, stop it. God says, no, sorry. Well, <laughs> so,
anger management. He didn't learn the lesson, so anger management kept him from being able to go into the promised land. Being serious, any other thoughts or any questions you guys have about this first, really two thirds of Exodus? Again, I'm hoping that once we've gone through the Bible in a year, and I, I don't know when I'm going to get to start them, but I want to go deeper and we'll do a more in-depth Bible study and we'll, we'll, we can look at these in depth. And if you are interested, you can go on my YouTube channel and you can see where I went in depth through Exodus. I took 28 weeks, hour and a half sessions to go through the book of Exodus. Forgive the photographer. Yeah, Melissa says forgive the photographer because she was videographer. You weren't taking stills. You were. That will also give you guys a glimpse of what we hope to do down in the chapel. Um, I know Jenny is, uh, we should have a video, I think, this Sunday for uh, what we're doing down there. And it's, I think it's going to be really neat. Once that's done, then we'll move our group into there and we'll be able to do a little bit more interactive than even what we're doing now through Zoom. So. Anything else for the good of the cause? Well, then let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this reminder that, Lord, you want a relationship with us. And, Lord, you'll do whatever it takes to redeem us. You would take on the gods of Egypt, and, Lord, you would take on the cross. So, Lord, help us to be mindful of that. Help us to live in relationship with you. And, Lord, may we truly be your people, shining your light into the darkness. And, Lord, may we seek to do our best to bring all those in this world around us into a right relationship with you. We thank you and we praise you. And we just ask you to go with us and dwell in us that we might be your people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you.